After the incessant hand-holding and easy difficulty of no production Heart of the Swarm, I'm looking forward to getting back to something a bit more complicated. With the knowledge that the world had about StarCraft II going into this run, it was so hard that multiple missions were mathematically impossible. I may have swung too far in the other direction here. The rules are the same as before. Play on normal and don't spend money to make new things. In addition, any unit spawning from the Spear of Adun, such as warp-in reinforcements or deploy Phoenix, are also banned. Normally, I skip the Legacy of the Void prologue in challenge runs because the missions aren't up to par and it can get a bit confusing for viewers starting with a tech tree and then reverting to nothing after a couple missions. But no production, the prologue has some really cool missions, so I'm starting here. Dark Whispers is first. Kerrigan's forces relentlessly assault the Terran defenders. My forces must maneuver through the complex, rescuing three groups of zealot prisoners before Kerrigan finishes off the Terran. With a starting force of two zealots and two stalkers, this is a bit of an uphill battle. Or it would be, if I didn't know a trick. As Kerrigan launches her first attack against Mobius, I use a stalker to draw its attention, and lead the Zerg onslaught in the direction I need to go. Kerrigan's overwhelming army easily clears the first zealot prison for me. After completing the bonus objective and getting a free set of reinforcements from Talus, it's time to do my own dirty work. Similarly to Legacy of the Void Deathless, Stalkers make a phenomenal unit in no production. The blink ability combined with shield regeneration means that they can slowly and steadily pull apart enemy forces without my side taking any permanent damage. Upon reaching the second prison, I need Kerrigan's help again. I charge past and pull her with me. Unfortunately, this time Kerrigan is kind enough to rescue my zealots from the prison for me and then proceeds to mutilate them. After a bit more careful clearing, I can once again use Kerrigan to help me bust the final fortified position. Except this time, I mess up. Being caught between a Terran encampment and the swarm is not good for my army. It dies, and I drop to zero supply. Kerrigan's army continues on the warpath and clears the final prison for me, probably looking for another snack. This run's already off to a great start. Ghosts in the Fog is usually a very odd mission. There are zero spots to build assimilators on the map. Instead, the player must rely on collecting Vespine pickups from these totally not Vespine geysers as they erupt. This doesn't matter to me. What does matter is that I have two Zealots, two Stalkers, and a Void Ray, and there's no way to get the ground forces to the end of the mission, meaning realistically, I have one Void Ray. This is going to be a common theme throughout Legacy of the Void. Wings of Liberty often would start the player with up to 10 combat units, and on the final mission, it's more like 60 supply. In Legacy of the Void, I believe the highest number of units given is 5? Maybe 6. Even more than before, this run is going to be making a lot happen with very little. With that in mind, my Void Ray crosses the map. There are two Stalkers, two Photon Cannons, and a Gateway that need to be disabled before they can churn out reinforcements that kill my Void Ray. Utilizing this high ground, I'm able to kill off the first Stalker and Pylon. Once my shields are up, I take out the second Stalker. I have a short amount of time to take out the final defenders before reinforcements are produced and Mr. Void Ray cannot win. After killing a cannon and disabling power to another, only the final boss remains, a carrier. One Void Ray cannot beat a carrier in a straight up fight. Instead, I have to abuse reset mechanics. I blast a nearby building to draw the carrier's attention, and then bank it hard to the right to get out of vision. Once the carrier reaches the position that the Void Ray was, it resets on a move command to its initial placement. While it's moving, the Void Ray moves in to engage, pulling back as soon as the movement is about to end. I repeat this process three times, take down the carrier, and finish off the door while desperately hoping that no enemies see me. The third mission of the prologue is a no-build mission, so I skip it, and head directly into Legacy of the Void proper, where I'm met with 4 Ire, another no-build mission. After finishing that up, I get back to the run with the Growing Shadow. This mission is really easy. I start with three Stalkers, and there are three Void Pylons on the map. When found, they give three more Stalkers each for a total of 12. 12 Stalkers might be the largest army I'm ever going to field in this run. They easily fight their way to the end of the mission and clear the Templar base of defenders. Spear of Adun is the first time that Legacy of the Void really shows off its stinginess in starting me with units. I have two Zealots and two Stalkers to beat the mission. If you've ever seen a Legacy of the Void challenge run, you're probably familiar with how this is going to go down. Each objective spawns a giant attack wave. If you're doing anything even remotely interesting here, then it suddenly becomes impossible to defend these waves, so I circumvent it by cleaning up every objective simultaneously. My big problem is a lack of damage output. Realistically, I only have two Stalkers to fight. The Zealots can't deal well with the masses of spine crawlers, Photon Cannons, and Zerg units. The first three Power Cells aren't much to talk about. Stalkers slowly pull Defenders out until the area is secure. I drop the objective to almost dead, and then hide a probe nearby for later. There are some harder foes that I have to get a bit tricky with, such as fighting an Ultralisk where I hold position a force field of probes while my Stalkers pelt it from a distance. 
The final objective is incredibly well defended. I honestly thought I was going to be out of luck here, until I ran behind it and found that there are no defenders from that side. With Sky Shield, I gain access to the attacking options on the Spear of Adun. Last time I ran this mission, it was in Zealots only, and it was really hard. Thankfully, this time I have only three Zealots. Great. Sky Shield is very open-ended about its progression. The five bases are all poorly defended, but get stronger as I secure more positions. The mission took me a couple hours of trial and error to figure out. I had to go into the mission and kill off each of the base's defenders in different orders, writing down what reinforcements spawn at what location, so I could find a set order to clear things out. The order I ended up on is very odd. Instead of securing the stabilizer right next to me, I head south. While I'm there, I take out the bonus objective for some solarite. I need every piece of solarite that I'm going to get to beat this campaign. The tactical flexibility of the Spear of Adun is more important than I ever could have imagined. After peeling apart the southern garrison, I head to what is normally the final objective. My probes bravely head in and round up the majority of the defenders where I can orbitally bombard them. Even though the timer is running dry, I decide to take a minute to rest up before finishing off the final defender here. This is where my plan comes into action. When stabilizers 2, 3, and 4 are cleared, Jim uses a scanner sweep to cinematically show off the new defenders for each of the remaining objectives. I take this opportunity to fire off an orbital strike. The reason I ended up on the strange clear order that I did was that so each time a stabilizer was cleared, a mix of threatening and non-threatening enemies spawn. That way, I can prioritize orbital strikes on banshees and siege tanks while letting the squishier targets live for later. The other key to my plan is saving the middle. At the beginning of the mission, I didn't simply bypass it. Instead, I cleared it of defenders, leaving a sole missile turret alive so it wasn't technically liberated. Each time reinforcements spawn there, they're greeted with the lone turret. I swiftly execute them and then return to what I'm doing. The next part of the mission is more of the same. Peel apart a fortification with Orbital Strike and Zealots, secure another stabilizer, and use the vision given to blast more enemies. But I'm taking too much time. I also have to defend against attacks, which are getting pretty fierce. I end up losing a third of my army and all but one probe to a particularly nasty strike force. As I rush to finish up the mission before the next attack, I mess up. Both of my Zealots die, and I have a single probe remaining, while two of the objectives aren't mine. All might seem lost, but I have a plan. I grab Probius and head to the center. He attacks the missile turret to bring it to 50% HP so it starts burning, and then I go. The champion of probe kind dashes to the final objective and heroically tanks Spectre Fire while the Spear of a Dune targets its shots. A volley of orbital strikes clear the mission of defenders at the same time the missile turret burns down, securing the final two objectives simultaneously and denying the final wave of reinforcements. And once again, it's proven that workers are the strongest unit in the game. Brothers in Arms is less of a puzzle than Sky Shield, but it's just as stressful. I only have two Immortals and must kill three hybrid Dominators at the end of the mission. Each of them can almost one-shot an Immortal. I can't fight that alone. Jim and Valerian are going to play a large role here. The normal gameplay loop for this mission involves defending against the hybrid when the Terran Stunning Disruption event happens, and then using the remaining time to push forward for your allies. Once the disruption ends, it's time to build up until the process repeats. In this run, the exact opposite happens. I provide fire support for Jim and Valerian while their forces tank the damage, securing them more outposts on the map. And then during the disruption, my immortals chaotically run around panicking for dear life. Two immortals cannot beat the hybrid attacks. If I let the hybrid do their thing, then the ally that they strike ends up irreversibly damaged, and if eliminated, I lose. So I have to grab the attention of the hybrid and flee. Immortals are not faster than the hybrid. I use a combination of my shielding and stunned Terran units to avoid my pursuers. Once the disruption event finishes, the hybrid find themselves in the middle of an armed and operational Terran battle line, and are quickly dealt with. When my allies have secured their final outpost, they begin to produce Thors and battlecruisers. At that point, it's a simple waiting game for the Terran to finish off the objective for me. Thanks, Jim. As soon as Glacius is unlocked, I head there. The mission is super cheesable, and I want to delay Shakoros for as long as I can. But the Solar Lance ability can open up a shortcut from the wrong side, avoiding about half of the mission's enemies. The mission has about 15 sentries and stasis that can be rescued. They aren't good at fighting, but they do have hit points. I charge through, solar lance the pylons that power the gate blocking the objective, and walk over to it. I never ended up making a video about the Legacy of the Void speedrun because I didn't enjoy it enough to practice, but I can still assimilate what I learned from it into the other runs. Amon's Reach is a fantastic example of this. I start with four Dark Templar and need to remove the creep from four shuttle bays. One DT goes north, one goes center, and two head to the right. This mission is designed so there's detection constantly patrolling around the map, forcing the player to be a secret agent. Knowing all of the important patrol routes makes things easy. 
The center and top left Templar arrive quickly at their objectives and start clearing. The pair on the right do the same, leaving one shuttle bay remaining. The path behind the right Templar has been closed due to some detectors, meaning these boys are on their own. I take the time to grab the bonus researches and head to the end of the mission. The waves of burrowing spore crawlers take too long to set themselves up and are not a threat. The final launch bay has a patrolling overseer. I avoid it, snipe the corruption, and end the mission in a cool 2 minutes and 20 seconds. I delayed last stand for as long as I could. Not because I had a particular plan heading into the run that needed specific unlocks, but because I had no idea how I was ever going to beat this mission. The mission is normally pretty easy. Make photon cannons and win. But fighting over 40 ultralisks and hybrid, plus a ton of banelings, zerglings, and flyers with a squad of 3 dark templar and 2 stalkers isn't exactly possible. To help out a tad, I have 2 cannons, a kaidaran monolith, and have unlocked the nexus overcharge upgrade. It's not much. The first problem are the xenostones. All three must be destroyed before the temple can be overloaded. I opt to rush them. Once the attack starts coming in full force, I won't be able to spare soldiers to take them down. Once they're done with, it's defense time. Getting to the required 1 billion zerg takes 25 minutes, and in that time, I can't give up a single unit. The early attack waves are fairly approachable. The Dark Templar harassment can usually mute a large number of enemies before they can reach my base. Things start to get sketchy when attacks launch from multiple sides. Individual Dark Templar aren't incredibly strong, and taking any damage on the unshielded temple is pretty devastating. And an even bigger threat are the air raids. Mutalisks, Guardian, and Hybrid Nemesis all attack from the top right. Two Stalkers cannot beat any of these waves alone. I must use Solar Lance to thin them out, and then kite the remainders to my overcharged Nexus. Shields are the blessing that saves me here. Much of the mission is dedicated to kiting enemies towards structures with shields, letting them drain those shields while taking them out, and then regenerating. This puts me on a rotation, trying to stop enemies from striking unshielded targets as they regenerate. At 800 million zerg, things are looking pretty good, until the hybrid arrive. With 1250 HP, I have nothing that can quickly kill off the hybrid reavers. This means that they're guaranteed to deal massive damage. Combine this with every attack wave coming from every angle and things quickly cascade out of control. Near the end, the attack waves alternate between big bulky hybrid groups and ultralisk baneling attack waves. I don't know which is worse. The baneling's burst damage guarantees the buildings are going to be stripped of shields and take hull damage, while the hybrid are so durable that they can easily connect with and finish off my weakened buildings. Meanwhile, on the backside, the flyers are too much. They crack my nexus and can fight uncontested. I die. A lot. I spent more than an hour on stream dying to the last two minutes. I had to end the stream for the day and was desperately thinking of a strategy for tomorrow. After playing with ideas for a bit, I had to make the dreadful conclusion. This mission is mathematically impossible to beat. As I sat discouraged, knowing that my units simply didn't have the damage to kill enemies as fast as they spawned, a viewer sent me a message on Discord, and instantly, everything made sense. When a mission is hard in a challenge run, I need cheese. When it's really hard, I need advanced cheese. And when it's impossible, I need turbo cheese. The next day, I settled down with my new strategy, determined to win. The message I received told me something interesting that I hadn't noticed during the chaos of the fighting. When I activate the targeting sequence for Solar Lance, the game pauses. Unit movement, attacking, and harvesting all stop instantly. But the Zerg counter on this specific mission continues to climb up for a second or two. If the end of the mission can't be beaten, the answer is simple. Don't play it. I reload a save to 900 million Zerg and get into action. I have a specific rotation to follow. First, I activate Solar Lance. Most of the game pauses, the camera zooms out, and the ticker slowly increases. When cancelling the targeting, it takes about a second for the Spear of a Dune UI to reappear and the ability can be reactivated. I cancel, pause the game, and wait for the interface to return. I then unpause and repeat the process. Each cycle takes about 3 in-game seconds to advance the game timer by 1 second, and it only gives the actual gameplay a fraction of a second to play out. In order to play out the final 2 minutes and 30 seconds of this run, I repeat this 50 times in a row. In the end, the temple is sitting at half-life, my defenses are fully cracked, and I don't care because I've won. Because of the insane difficulty of this mission, the strategy ended up being the cheesiest, most game-breaking thing I've ever done in a challenge run, so far. Thankfully, Temple of Unification is a nice break from the difficulty. The enemy starts recapturing the five locks at the four minute mark. Their relentless aggression at that point means that my three Phoenix, two Stalker Force can't win. But if I beat the mission before that, then there's no problem. 
The first lock is easy enough. I pull my enemies away from their defensive positions, lift them with Graviton Beam, and finish them off while they're helpless. The center lock is more of the same. Generally, the top right lock is the final one. The defenders in front of it are pretty fierce. To circumvent this, I use my Phoenix to spot the high ground, blink up, and lift the scary siege tank. At this point, there are two locks left. I split my Phoenix Force and head towards both at once. The south is covered by a large number of infantry, and the north by two Archons and two Stalkers. I simultaneously move my Phoenix to line up the enemies on both sides. I then use Solar Lance, firing two beams up north to finish off the Archons and one down south to clean up the infantry, allowing me to capture both. Or I could if the Northern Phoenix hadn't been killed. I scramble my Phoenix Squadron north before too many defenders can arrive. Two Stalkers remain. I bait them off of the objective, use Graviton Beam to immobilize them, and slip my Phoenix back onto the final lock before things get any worse. In order to blitz through this mission, I did have to skip the Titanic Warp Prism bonus objective, but it was absolutely worth it for a mostly easy victory. After a brief no-build mission with Artanis and Kerrigan comes Hamburger of Oblivion, a mission that ended up playing out in a pretty unique way. Having three High Templar and three Zealots means that while my sustained damage is lacking, I have some incredible burst with Psy Storm and Feedback. Instead of acting as the main combat force, I instead support my allied Kerrigan's attack waves. The Centurion Zealot can soak a bit of damage, pulling back when injured, and then the Zerg can do the majority of the work. The most powerful tool I have is Shield Overcharge, which works on allied units as well as mine. Giving Kerrigan's swarm of Zerglings 200 shields apiece is incredible. I really wish I had that ability on Zerglings only. After clearing the first two crystals comes the most difficult defenses to break. Fortunately, Kerrigan was getting bored and decided to come help, even bringing an Ultralisk. And to nobody's surprise, Kerrigan is pretty good in no production runs. After securing the third crystal, Kerrigan goes home, but she doesn't stop sending forces. The rest of the mission is a simple loop of waiting for her strikes, providing covering fire and shielding, and waiting for the next wave. Repeat until the enemy is dead. After Olnar is where the difficulty of the campaign really starts to ramp up. The mission I'm most afraid of is Rakshir, so I opt to do the Purifier questline first to stall for time. This doesn't actually help me. It's not like unlocking more units that I'm not going to be allowed to build has any value in this run. This is literally the challenge run version of procrastinating. While easier than Rakshir, I started off quite concerned about unsealing the past. The three zealots and three long zealots that I get are not much against the large number of zerg. Normally, I would feel confident in my kiting and AI manipulation abilities, but escort quests are always a bit tricky because my ally can be very dumb. I decided to try something new. The first threat in this mission is an attack wave from the bottom left base. The standard procedure is to clear the first and second locks and then clean up that base while waiting for the megalith. Today I tried sending my colossus straight towards that base. If I can stop it before it ever gets going, then I'll be golden. And the idea worked great. It turns out the majority of the defenses here are built over time. Three zerglings and hydralisk die and the base goes down without an issue. And if that works so well, why not try to snipe the lair at the top as well? I send my Colossus to the end of the mission and use Spear of a Dune to cover and take out the Zerg's second base about 15 minutes before I'm supposed to be there. With the Zerg's attacking ability neutered, the rest of the mission is pretty relaxing. The Megalith tanks enemies while the Colossus cleave through them. And then I made a mistake. I thought it would be clever to send my probes to the end of the mission, getting Vision to toss down a few solar lances and take out the defenders. I forgot about the trigger at the end that spawns a mass of Nidus worms. After the workers are killed by the Zerg unloading from the worms, they head to my main base. The combination of Nexus Overcharge and Solar Lance managed to clean it up, but I do get embarrassingly close to having lost. After that, things are calm. The normally difficult end of the mission was easier with cleared out enemies, empty Nidus Worms, and a dead lair, making the final push smooth sailing. Purification, on the other hand, is insanely difficult. I get two Zealots and an Immortal on the mission that is infamous for repeated brutal hybrid attack waves. I opt for the Vanguard variant of the Immortal. Realistically, the Immortal is the only unit that I'm going to be getting combat value from, so I need its splash. The other two options would just get overwhelmed by Zerglings. The 12 locks on the map are spread out fairly evenly, and many of them are not particularly cheesable. The only saving grace is that a lock dies to one volley of Solar Lance. With that in mind, Mr. Vanguard starts on his journey. The defenses on the left are the easiest. With careful poking, the defenders around two of the locks are taken out with a Solar Lance clipping the third. The Northern Quadrant is next. One lock is completely undefended while the other two can be reached with Solar Lance. This Solar Lance system is working really well, until the enemy air units start attacking. Now I have to use it defensively because I don't have a unit that can shoot up. This drains both my energy and my time. 
I take a moment to head to the bonus objective. The Purifier Warden has 4000 HP and does high area damage. I managed to kill it by engaging and disengaging repeatedly with Shield Overcharge, but I ended up taking so long that I would die. I have to leave this one alone. By now, the enemy attacks are getting incredibly powerful. Multiple hybrid and large air forces are common. I have to kite the enemies to my base to get support from my Nexus. The attack damage is nice, but I really need its high HP total to tank hits from the hybrid. After some more solar lancing vulnerable targets, there are three objectives remaining, two in the east and one in the south. I have to start sacrificing units. I send my two zealots to the right. Zealot number one exists solely to provide vision for solar lance, while the second does an old speedrunning trick. He runs to the objective with his resurrect off cooldown. Once he's killed, the enemies chasing him will de-aggro. If he's behind this lock, there's no enemies that will find him and he can wail on it uncontested. And then he proceeds to just murder the Hydralisk he was supposed to reset and take down the lock without an issue. What a legend. For the final seal, I overcharge my probes, send them in, and snipe it with Solar Lance. It feels sort of off that the mission was won almost entirely on the back of Solar Lance, but I can confidently say that if these objectives had 601 HP, the mission would be almost impossible. It's time to go to Slain, but before Rakshir come Steps of the Right. The plan here is simple, desperately defend during the Terrazine Fogs, and then win quickly. To make this work, I have a couple of new tools. The Void Ray is a famously balanced unit that everybody loves playing against, and the Repair Beam passive means that I can now take whole damage on my mechanical units without fear. The first Terrazine Fog is fairly uneventful. It's designed to be easy. But once I'm done, I head out. My Voids head to the bottom of the map to engage the first of Malash's Guardians. While they hit hard and deal area damage, they're technically buildings, so they can't chase my damaged ships. While I take out the bottom left Guardian, I'm abusing the mission's final trick, the Adept. The Psionic Transfer ability allows Adepts to bypass the majority of the mission's defenders, as long as you know exactly where to stop. Once they're in a safe spot near the objective, I can use the vision from Psionic Transfer to bombard the enemy Guardian with the Spear of Adun. Once two objectives are down, the Voids float home, and the Adepts shade to safety. The second fog has stronger enemies than before, but it's not a problem. Once it subsides, I head out again, but this time I'm on the clock. I cannot survive the next fog. I have to win now. The plan is the same as before. Two voids kill the right guardian while adept shade to the far objective. The mission has some weirdly large gaps in the ground defense. It's specifically designed with flyers in mind and leaves a giant empty courtyard on the ground path for my adepts to sit in while they shade. But I have a problem. The fog is rolling in. There isn't enough time to solar lance this objective down before I'm eliminated. And the void rays can't reach this location. This is where doing challenge runs really pays off. I learned in Zealots only that the Guardians can't actually attack ground. Instead, they have an ability to briefly lift ground units and a strong anti-air attack, but it's not quite enough to kill an Adept. I shade my Adepts right next to the final Guardian, blast the scouts that would aggro, and finish off the Guardian as he helplessly stands around. Now comes the mission that I've been dreading, Rakshir. This mission very quickly becomes an overwhelming onslaught of Taldorim attacks. I need to finish it as fast as possible with a perfect setup of abilities. Repair Beam and Solar Lance are both required. There are carriers who I cannot fight without Solar Lance, and Repair Beam allows me to clear more quickly because I don't have to be careful about taking damage. I also need Shield Overcharge. The hybrid at the end can one-shot my units with Plasma Blast and slaughter my workers with Psy Storm. I need the temporary durability increase. It's really a shame that I couldn't collect enough Solarite from bonus objectives to afford Shield Overcharge. So I get the infinitely inferior Mass Recall instead. The beginning of the mission goes great. I aggressively start clearing the enemy, only taking a couple of minutes off to take down the bonus objectives for later. There are a few lines of Taldurim defenses on the path that Alarak and Malash travel. All but the final one are quickly and easily cracked. I reach the end without breaking a sweat. And right as I start to feel overconfident, I meet the final boss of Legacy of the Void. This hybrid dominator. He is insane. It turns out that fighting someone who can one-shot everything I have access to is really hard. Doubly so if he's inside of a base that produces units constantly to reinforce him. Triple that if he has triggers that warp in rounds of enemies to support him. And quadruple it if you throw some carriers into the mix. If I had more time, I could kill them easily, but the rabid attack waves they send to contest the objective are too much, I don't have that time. After failing for the 7 billionth time, I reach a frustrating conclusion. I have to fully reset the mission. I was too slow. Starting the fight at the 15 minute mark is too late. I restart and rush even faster. I end up able to engage the hybrid dominator at 14 minutes instead of 15. And he proceeds to crush me anyway. I didn't say this was going to be easy. 
But eventually, the right combination of baiting Plasma Blast with probes, engaging from the right angle, and pullback micro leads to me taking the Dominator down. I then get really lucky on Carrier Spawn and am able to push Malash into the pit before the scary defenders arrive. Templar's Charge is the final mission before the end game of Ire. Normally, this mission is really easy. Make carriers and attack move. This time, the nature of the carrier is working against me. In standard play, the interceptors that the carrier launches do an incredible job of soaking damage, but in a no production run, a dead interceptor is a flat reduction in the carrier's firepower. I delayed this mission until Slain was finished so I could have access to my ultimate abilities. Time Stop is the only way to keep interceptors alive against the high counts of marines, missile turrets, and hybrid. It does make the mission very uninteresting. I sit around waiting for the cooldown, use it, move in, and snipe the objective, and then recall. If the objective lives, I send a spotter to finish it off with the Spear of a Dune. That's it. I repeat the process three times and move on to Ire. I'm not a big fan of the Time Stop ability, I think it's too strong, and I try to avoid it whenever I can. As a result, I will not be using Time Stop again in this run. Sort of. Before the real hard stuff begins is Templar's Charge. While two-thirds of the mission are no-build segments, there is a section where Karaks can reclaim robotic units and produce from robotics facilities to face a wave of hybrid. It turns out that the additional production units are completely unnecessary. The Immortals are just that good. In my entire history of challenge running, I've never done a mission as difficult as the host without production. The objective is super unique. There are five void shards around the map that must be destroyed. Each is guarded by a progressively stronger group of enemies. In terms of raw enemy power, it's pretty easy to argue that the host has the strongest suite of enemies in the game. The defenders of each objective respawn quickly and infinitely. They attack often and sport high numbers of flyers. This is not good news for my four zealots and two stalkers. To make matters worse, the shards are specifically designed so that the infinite respawning enemies will defend them from any angle. They cannot be cheesed with fancy placement. At first I thought that repeated solar bombardments could take out the objectives while I defended, but the frequent and brutal attack waves are already enough to break any player. If I were to sit at home using the full force of the Spear of Adun to defend, I would still die. The host is mathematically impossible. This means I only have a couple options. I can admit the run isn't possible, I can change the rules, or I can change the math. The night before I attempted this run on stream, I was deep into testing. Not on the host, but on the next mission, Salvation. I was wondering if the Solar Lance time stall bug from Last Stand would work on the final mission as well. It turns out the answer is no, but in my testing, I found something far more powerful. I would go as far to say that I discovered the single most game-breaking bug in StarCraft. And it doesn't actually help on Salvation at all. But it's really good on the host. The first step is to wait for five minutes. Once Purifier Beam is ready, it's time. First, I call the Solar Lance ability. From there, I open the menu with F10, save, and reload the game. Once the game is reloaded, I find myself in the Solar Lance targeting interface with the Spear of a Dune available to use. I then activate the targeting for Purifier Beam during the targeting for Solar Lance and use the ability. When that resolves, Solar Lance is gone from the Spear of a Dune, the Purifier Beam fires, and most importantly, every trigger in the game is now disabled. The enemy will not attack, bonus objectives will not trigger, and most importantly, the enemies will not respawn. The reason this works is because of how the Spear of a Dune functions. When Solar Lance and Purifier Beam are called up for activation, they activate a trigger that pauses all other triggers. Once the ability is targeted, the pause is removed. The trick is that each of these pauses are independent of each other. I'm effectively applying two stacks of the pause, and then with the activation of Purifier Beam, only removing one of them. With the enemy crippled, I can take the mission at my own pace. And that does a great job at showing why this mission is so insane. With the game literally broken, it takes me 33 minutes of attacking to deal enough damage to kill the Void Shards. While I'm overjoyed to have discovered this bug, I don't intend to use it on other challenge runs unless things truly become impossible. It feels against the spirit of what I do to trivialize the end of Legacy of the Void whenever I want, though I do wish it worked on Salvation. And as a side note, in the last year and a half, a ton of StarCraft bugs have been discovered, many of which I haven't gotten to show in any videos. I'm considering making a bug and glitch exhibition video, but I don't actually know if people are interested in something like that. I would love to know your opinion in the comments. Just like the host, Salvation cannot be done without a plan. Unfortunately, this time, there's no game-breaking bug to back me up. I effectively have two Immortals and two Ranged Warriors to deal with huge swaths of Zerg, 
and an even scarier number of carriers, tempests, and motherships. Normally, I do much of my challenge running blind, running into problems on stream to learn what's up and then troubleshooting live until a solution is found. Salvation gives me no such luxury. Instead, it was studying time. The top left is guarded by Vorazun's Dark Templar. She's fairly strong against ground, but is severely lacking in the anti-air department. This is why I was forced into the air attacking Annihilator and Dragoons. I need their damage output and durability to take down key Protoss units such as carriers. Vorazun's Dark Templar can theoretically mind control powerful enemies to support her forces, but more often than not, they steal an Overseer or something, making it fairly unreliable. Eventually, she starts producing up to three Void Rays. These are the linchpin for her, and if she ever loses more than one in a single fight, it's a reset. The middle is controlled by Alarak. Unfortunately, he's hit significantly harder than the other sides. Almost all of my Spear of Adun use is specifically tuned around protecting Alarak himself. His incredible damage is the only way for the middle to live, but his brittle melee build makes things tricky. Unfortunately, I can't put Alarak in a box today. The southeast is controlled by Karax. Initially, he's the weakest defender by far, requiring a ton of aid. His overproduction of energizers who don't deal much damage hurts him early. The Colossus he eventually starts producing changes all of that. Once they're out, Karax can be given minimal support and will clean up the ground forces without a second thought. He always struggles against air, though. With the aid of a couple viewers, I ended up on a document that not only detailed when and where each attack would come, but also what units to engage exactly when to use each Spear of a Dune ability on what target, as well as what units it was okay for my AI allies to lose during each attack. Everything was planned to the letter. We left no room for uncertainty. For example, at the 8 minute and 45 second mark, there's a Zerg wave that attacks Karax, and the Golden Armada strikes to the northwest. I move my forces to help defend Karax, specifically using Shadow Cannon to deal with the enemy Ultralisks, while using Solar Lance as early as possible against the Golden Armada in the northwest. This is timed out specifically so that the next Golden Armada wave reaches my base right as Solar Lance comes off cooldown and Shadow Cannon is available to snipe the incoming Warp Prism. With this choreographed dance, things aren't bad, until the Spear of Adun starts to lose its weapon systems. Once Solar Lance is gone, life becomes much more difficult. Of course, this is around the time the enemy amps up the aggression, hitting from multiple places at the same time. Near the end, my notes on each attack have become paragraphs. For example, at 2320, there's a big Golden Armada attack wave on Vorazun. I must support her against the Onslaught by pulling enemies early to fight them as a trickle, all while managing my forces as well as watching her unit count. This is all to be able to reach Alarak in time for the massive Protoss wave that strikes him. Alarak must survive until the end, otherwise his side will absolutely fall. When the Golden Armada and Zerg hit Alarak, I must use the final Purifier Beam to clear everything up. Meanwhile, a small group of Zerg are attacking Vorazun. After using Shadow Cannon or the Guardians to protect Alarak, I must identify how well Vorazun's doing and then decide how to split my forces against another incoming Zerg attack wave against Alarak. Honestly, it probably wasn't even that fun to watch this play out live. I had to pause after every wave to figure out how to position myself, prepare for the next wave, and count allied units to be sure I could survive the next round. But all of this preparation paid off. I survive until the final wave. In the end, my allies are broken, my probes put up a valiant last stand, pulling the enemy into my base to buy time, and at the 30 minute mark, with no supply, no base, and an artifact on single digit HP, I can confirm that it is possible to be Legacy of the Void without building anything. Though without breaking anything would be another story.